Uh, let me begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to speak here. Um, my name is uh, Hoi Kwang Lo. I'm from the University of Toronto. I'm going to tell you how we're going to back up with the quantum hackers to make QKQ secure. And you can read more about our work uh, from our review paper here and also some original papers here. Okay. So here's our lab, my talk. I will introduce the security problems for QKQ. And there are two issues, right? One is a measurement issue, so the second aspect will be the measurement issues. And I forget a couple of source issues, right? The source security. And finally, I present you the summary. Okay. Okay, let me begin with um, the introduction. Well, in theory, we all know QKQ is secure. Right, get security proofs. So what's the problem? The problem is all those proofs assume we have a perfect single photon source. Well, not if, well, at least in BBA4, we assume a perfect single photon source. And then we assume we have some sort of uh, perfect or almost perfect single photon detectors. And now, let's think about if, of course, the actual system is not perfect. Okay, so we never have a perfect single person source, so maybe we have some weak coherent source. How about detectors? Well, it will be imperfect, right? It's a very complicated device, lots of things are happening, there's electronics, there's solid state physics, who knows what's going on in the detectors? So we can not be sure. And the e chopper, what she can do is that she can attack both the source and the detectors. And that's sort of a huge challenge to security. Okay, so a big question we ask is following. Okay, if you use QKQ, can someone else break it? Um, and there was one talk um, yesterday morning by Joaquin Makarov on the security issues. Right. Maybe he cannot go through all those key cows, but I mean, there are some, I mean, as you know, I guess a list, a whole list of security problems, a list of attacks that people have done on QKQ system. I won't go through all this with you. I would mention that um, some of the attacks were on the sources and some were on the detectors. So uh, many people have done contributions here. Uh, I should mention, for example, Fei Hu has some contributions on the uh, phase we method attack here. So, uh, I borrowed this from him, so I should mention his name, I guess. <laughs> and um, my book also did work on the calm shift attack. Let's see where's calm shift right here. And of course, Rakeem Marco has done a lot of work. I right? very nice work on the well, well known work on um, hacking the detectors, the light illumination, and more recently on laser damage attacks. So I think people have heard about some of these attacks. Okay, we have attacks. How about hard time measures? Well, you may say, okay, if we know the problem, why don't we fix it? Like Microsoft, we have security patches. Well, it works for the specific attack. However, it doesn't work for more general attacks. Right? So once each shopper knows what we are doing, of course, she can look into some new attacks. So that would be a problem. Well, or maybe, right, um, we can sort of model a system better, understand the, the system, and make it work. But again, it's very challenging, right? How do we understand the whole system? Right? How do we understand the whole physics? So that's difficult. Another approach we will come up with, which we heard about, about in the morning, um, is this device independent QKG idea. It's based on this loophole fee broadcast, which we had about in this morning sections, like if there were like four very nice talks on the subject, so people know about it. Um, and no key scaffolding, okay? so all those talks emphasize we need um, high detection efficiency. We need detectors with nearly unique detection efficiency. And that's a challenge. And what happened is not only the detectors have to be good, but we are sending photons over long distance in QKG, right? so long distance communication. So the loss in the optical link is a challenge. 
Or you can imagine, right, maybe we do some sort of heralding, right? So based on the transmission, you have vulgar focus, which we heard about in the morning as well. Again, this could be done in principle, and there has been some experimental experts, but it's still quite challenging to make it practical. Okay, so in the end, um, if you look at the current simulation, like the best result people have got uh, for a key wave is quite low, like canker mass, canker pulse, with a parametric ground conversion source. So maybe we need some new sources, right? like on the MV center or whatever, to make it work in practice. Um, I won't go into all details, so um, the wise independent QKG goes from Myers and Yao, and there are lots of interesting paper on the subject. One thing I should also emphasize is following. So even if you can do DIQKG, it doesn't mean that it's perfectly secure. That's the end of the story. Because uh, as people have mentioned in the morning, memory could be a problem. Once you generate a key, the key is in your system. And you could, in theory, imagine the future action may depend on the key if there's some memory in the system. OK, the memory attack is actually a challenge in QKG. And this is, uh, has been discussed by uh, people in this paper, QKG. And this memory attack relates to the channel, which I have no kind of go into details, but I mean, this is a general problem that we have to face up with. OK, so with all this in mind, now let's move on to the next subject. Um, think about detection security. So we want to do something that we can do with current technology. We can do it now, why can say 10 years from now? Like 10 years from now, maybe DIQKG is a norm, right? So we don't know. Um, so I recall about this subject of the measurement, measurement device independent QKG, MDI QKG. And the reason why we're interested in this subject is that it's automatically in mail to all known attacks and all the undiscovered attacks. OK, so this is a very general idea. It works in general. Uh, I should emphasize the following, right? Focon detectors really is the weakest part is actually the hill of QKG. Because when you send the photons from R to Bob, Yves will be there listening. Right? And Yves can send in some strong pulses or laser damage or whatever to a single photon detector. Right? You don't know what will happen here. OK, so it's very hard for us to, to really quantify what's going on. So that's the big challenge. OK, so I hope I convince people that the weakest link in QKG right now is the, or up to recently, is the measurement unit. OK, in fact, most of the attacks, right, if you look at here, are not on the sources. Most of the attacks are on the detectors. The whole list here, uh, down here, are on the detectors. OK, so the detectors is a challenge. OK, so, so what's the solution? So the solution that we propose in our paper in 2012 here, um, by the way, I should also mention my collaborator, Bing Chi. Where is Bing Chi? Yeah, he's here, so, um, and Marco Serki. Um, so we have this MGI QG, a measurement device in the case. So what we do is following. We move the measurement unit from Bob. Oh, what's going on? Going too fast. Okay, so let's see. We move the measurement unit of Bob to Charlie or Eve. Right, so Eve, we give Eve the control of the measurement unit. What about Bob? Well, Bob has to do something. What if Bob just do? what Alice is doing. Right? So both Alice and Bob are sending signals to Charlie. And Charlie here will perform a bell state measurement. So I guess people heard about and kind of swapping bell state measurement in the morning. So it's the same type of measurement that we perform here. And you can be done um, with current technology. OK, so what you, you think about this kind of setup, so what happened here? So now if you send in photons from Iris and Bob, one photon from Iris, one photon from Bob, they go to Charlie's detector. 
and Charlie will announce the result of Bell-scale measurement. Okay, and what's the impact? The impact is, is imagine a scenario, right? Um, we have two people, say, Obama and Putin, trying to talk to each other. And of course, they don't trust their relations, right? They don't trust uh, other countries, right? So if they talk, they don't want to rely on other countries. So the question is, how can we make QKG, in principle, secure with untrusted relate in this setup? And the whole point is, this Charlie, if it's untrusted, we don't have to trust if to be secure. And it will still work. So you can buy equipment from whatever vendor or whatever country, like country X. And you can still make QKG secure. So that's the impact of MGI QKG. And since our proposal, there like, have been quite a few demonstrations. Um, well, there were four initial demonstrations in the next um, couple of years. Well, they are by different groups, like Calgary, Brazil, China, USKC group, and my group in Toronto. And two of them are proof of principle demonstration. And two of them have switching of faces and bits. Okay, and uh, well, I won't go into all details, but some of them are based on time being, some of them are based on polarization. Okay, and you, they work. Okay. So MGI QKG should work in experiments. It's not just a free regular proposal. Okay. And more recently, like, there have been more work. MGI QKG network. So you can have a network set up. Alice, um, Bob, and maybe Gary Rick. This is Gary Rick. This is Charlie. So Alice, Bob, and Gary Rick can talk to each other with an untrusted relay, Eve or Charlie in the middle. Um, people have also gone long distance in here. What people are doing is long distance MKQG over 404 kilometers. But remember, we use the coil case in QKG in this uh, setup, right? So with the coil case, you can go in your long distance, so 404 kilometers. And also high bit rates, right? There's a, an experiment with 100 bit rate laser and one megabit per second, so that's pretty fast. Okay, so Lots of demonstration work very well. Okay, so you may wonder, so fundamentally, how, lo how large is the key rate? So we have done this analysis in our paper here. And what we found is MKQKG actually works quite well. It's a highly efficient with scale of art, high efficiency single photon detectors. So if you get efficient detectors, like 93% efficiency, and you can reach um, the efficiency, you can key rate here, you get this a key rate, and this a the loss or distance uh, in DB. So the key rate that we got from MGI QKG would be this solid line. And the fundamental limit, I think we heard about it um, on Monday's lecture, the fundamental limit, uh, for example, there's one uh, by KGW here, is right here. Okay, so there's some difference, of course, but it's not too far. It's like about two August molecules difference. Okay. And then we know why the difference comes from, because we have the case case and we, are not, we don't have single photon source. Right? Okay, so the good news is MGQG performs quite well in terms of key rate. I guess why we can go in long distance and it works well. Any questions so far? Okay, so in the long run, right, we, the question is, we want to solve not only the detector problem, right? we want to solve both the problems with a detector and the source. So the question is, how to adjust both problems? Okay, so now we come to the next subject, the source imperfections. So what we are saying is, just to remind people, um, because MGIQK may all be secure, right? So all these attacks will not work in MGIQK. So what's left for Yves Shabba? Yves will not be our business, right? Yves will be always be in business because Yves will always try to attack the sources. So now we have a look in the causes. Okay, so the way I think about it is the following. So let's think about what assumptions we actually make at the source and try to weigh it down carefully. And, and this is what I have got so far. Okay, of course, there will be more assumptions if we think more carefully. Um, well, previously, at least five years ago, if you ask me, right, we assume the encoding is perfect. And we assume there's no side channel. We assume perfect quantum number generation. 
Well, the phase is really random, so it's a perfect phase randomization. And the intensity is under control. We know exactly what intensity we're sending. Luckily, in the last five years, right, we have made some progress. So we are now moving beyond this idealized model. Okay, so let me just give you some insights, right? How far we have gone to removing these assumptions or relaxing those assumptions. Okay, let me begin with the first two uh, problems, right? Two assumptions. Perfect encoding, side channel. So the question is, do we really need perfect encoding? Okay, so let's see. How can we do MDLT with source force? So, well, this slides off, repeat the main issues, right? Of course, um, in MDLT, we assume the source is trusted, but the source is not perfect. And there will be some multiple components from which go in post. Well, that's not a problem. People knew about this problem for a long time, and then we can use the case case, right? In fact, MDLT works with the case case. That's fine. But the main point is here. This state preparation force, right? So the actual state that we prepare, um, let's see, I think I got the, uh, the actual state that we prepare are not exactly the state, right? Or something else. Okay, let's think about this uh, a bit more. Um, so we are planning to prepare horizontal, vertical, and the other polarization. But in fact, there may be some key variation. Like the actual scale we prepare may be an angle delta to get to the perfect scale. Okay? So instead of using a perfect encoding, we might be using something plus some delta. Delta is a key variation. Okay? And then for each signal, there's some delta. So the voltage we apply may not be correct, basically. Right? Yeah, uh, independent delta. Yeah, that's right. So um, yeah. Delta are independent delta. <laughs> that's right. Okay, so now how are we going to solve this problem? Of course, you, say, you can say, oh, we already know about this problem right, from a long time ago. Uh, there's this paper by GLP, by Dr. Smith, um, myself, Lucan House, and Pesco, which call about this problem. And then you can write down the fidelity, right? You can write down imperfections. Just come from the fidelity between these guys. Ah, fidelity between the two bases, right? X bases and C bases. For RS and Bob, right? X and C. And then you can build this uh, bias in the system in the basis dependence, right? And then you can make it work. But the problem in the original GLP paper is that we are very pessimistic, where we assume Eve can do whatever she wants. She can enhance the imperfections by uh, exploiting the loss in the channel. So if you're lost in the channel, we assume Eve can do some sort of post selection to enhance her Eve dropping. Okay, and because of that, right, we, uh, with the initial imperfection, we divide it by this game, the Charles Mickens for the single photons. Okay, and because of that, it has very poor performance, right? Because it's not very really loss color. If there's loss, the, pro the imperfection becomes a big problem. Okay. And uh, in fact, right, uh, we have done this uh, GLP analysis, right? Uh, and then you can see a small amount of uh, in encoding for, so like six, zero plus zero six three radian, very small amount. And then even less, right, even one half or maybe yeah, one half or maybe one four forget, the key rate already drops a lot. So this is a key rate versus uh, loss or distance, if, if how you look at it. So key rate really drops substantially because of imperfections in JLP. Okay, so the bottom line is with a prior security analysis JLP, the key rate decays very fast even for small calculus. Okay. So this is very bad. We don't like this. Okay. okay, so now we want something better. So what do we do? Um, we would like to use something which is a loss current protocol. And this has been discussed in this paper, Tamaki, very recent paper, uh, 2014. And, well, it works in general, okay, so just for simplicity, right, we use this free scale protocol, so um, 0 and 1 in the C basis, and 0 in X basis. The assumption that we make is that um, it's really a kill bit. Think about single photon component. It's really a qubit get as and body banks. There's no side channel. Okay, so that's what we assume. Okay. If we assume this, um, and then you do this careful analysis. So you estimate the phase error by using rejected data analysis. So you use the events where as and body are using really different bases. You don't throw it away, you keep it. Like that has been proposed, it might be useful. Okay, and with that in mind, you can consider a key between as and Bob using a C basis. 
And we have done the demonstration uh, with commercial QG systems. Um, so in fact, uh, my uh, former student, Fei Hu, did the demonstration and this published there, and then he actually won the best student paper prize in this conference two years ago. Okay. So I hope people know this results. Okay, so what's the next step? So this has been done for a commercial system. The next step is I want to use this and combine it with the MGI QGG system. And the reason is I want to have security against both the source and the detector oils. Okay, let me say a few words about what we did. Um, the details you can find in this paper by my student, Xu Yuan Ken, um, and people in my group and co-workers. So it has been published recently in 2016 this year. Okay, so what we do is um, we implement MGA QGG with source 4 and the encoding scheme is we use for our encoding and we need to know how much for we have in the encoding so we have characterized by quantum scale chromography I will say more about it the case concept we have performed is not cubic uh, we did it only over 10 kilometers and 40 kilometers uh, with a single mole fiber it's a simple demonstration okay uh, oh, yeah, I forgot to say, the replication rate is 10 megahertz. <laughs> it's not a fast cut, but I think it's acceptable, 10 megahertz, okay? Um, let me just walk through the, uh, well, I don't know, um, if, so I just walk through it quickly. So um, we have a laser source, and then we alternate it to single focal level using this VOA, variable optical alternator. And we apply a random phase, phase randomization. Right? You find a number generator, we apply phase randomization, phase modulator here. And then um, we uh, chop it off into pulses. So we have this enhancing modulator to chop off the pulses. Now we use a post stuff. So it's laser CW. Okay? And then we uh, generate the Picasso by this AOM. And we have some random numbers to choose the um, state. And we do polarization encoding. Right? And then we have some sort of polarization compensation just to make it work and get some uh, wearable optical delay lines just to make sure the timing information is not an issue, right? <coughs> okay. uh, by the way, I should mention that uh, the laser that we use a frequency stable line, so they have really very similar frequency. The difference is less than 10 megahertz. Okay, um, and what we did here is also an upgrade of our previous experiments because um, we um, increased the clock rate from 500 kilohertz to uh, 10 megahertz, and the concussion efficiency also goes up from 10 percent to 20 percent just by using new detectors. Okay, this is not the best you can do, but this is what we can do with um, existing commercial systems. Okay. I think people can do something better in the future. Okay, quantum scale chromography. So uh, we need to know what case we are encoding. So what we do is um, with a QKG source, right, we perform some kind of measurement um, on it. So do some sort of polarization location and measure the output scale and we project a scale into one of the four, well, you, well, I mean, you could try six, right? In principle, you should try six, but I mean, four would be enough. So you, you do a chromography and get the output in four possible chromography scales. And these are inputs, the three scales that we use, and then we get some data. And based on that, we can um, work out what scale gives us the answer. So we find that the three scales we got are within this uncertainty circle. Ideally, right, the overlap between H and V should be zero. Experimentally, it's not zero, but it's close to zero. Zero plus zero, Q4. Ideally, the overlap between H and V should be zero point five. We got something very close, zero point four nine nine four. So everything seems to be in order. Oh, by the way, I should mention why it works is because we have to fine tune. So we do optimization. We fine tune the voltage such that it works well. Okay. So this after a lot of optimization. Okay, so let's do a comparison. So we have seen some uh, results for GLP, um, which is uh, here. So GLP results is the um, lower path here, and it drops very quickly to zero. Okay, so um, when there's some errors, that's a big problem. But with the lost current protocol, what we see is that the key rate remains very high, okay, in this region. And the experimental data, um, with final key analysis, the experimental data we got is here, and then without final key analysis, you can do it also, for you get some results like this. 
Okay, so the bottom line is uh, what I said here. Um, with last current protocol, the key weight remains quite high, even for a reasonable Galka, which is great news. So Kilgagi works with Intuit and Erwin. Okay, so let me just summarize the result. GLLP gives a pessimistic assumptions on the source, and instead we can use your last current protocol, uh, and the key rate will be substantially improved. And this last current protocol is secure against the source wall. And we have demonstrated a feasibility to generate a secure key, even with false balls in MGA secure key. Okay, so if you want to know the details, you can read this paper. Okay, let me just uh, give, give us an example. Right? So let's go back to the relaxing assumptions and see that slide. Right, perfect encoding. Now we see that last one program works, so we don't have to think about that. So we can just do it with encoding for. Um, side channel, there has been a recent paper, uh, for, well, just an example, right, by Koshiba Group on, um, and also um, Kamaki and Ma Marcus Kirky on how we can understand side channels, right? Compute how much information is leaked to each other. So that's one step that people can try. Perfect random numbers, well, you don't need perfect random numbers, right? You just need good, perfect, good random numbers, you quantify it, and then you use something called the extractor, so having people heard some talks about it. So that's one direction. Um, phase randomization, you don't really need perfect phase randomization. You can randomize with a discrete phase. Only a few bits of randomization would be enough. Okay, so that has been done. Perfect intensity control, in principle, you don't need it, okay? In fact, uh, I think Monday gave us a talk by uh, my collaborator, Aki Hero, so he, he calls us that intensity fluctuation could be taken care of. Okay, so the good news is we're making some progress, right? We are not all the way there, but we are making some progress. And we can relax some assumptions in QKG. Okay, so is QKG really safe again? So the hope is we want to make QKG safe. <laughs> and uh, say, so, uh, what? <laughs> okay, so that what about what's your dream? So people call quantum internet. So of course, the long term dream is quantum internet. And uh, if you are using your commercial, geese, your smartphone or something, where well, you want to make sure that. These are low-cost device, right? So um, the smartphone should be low-cost device. So uh, in QKG, I mean, people have proposed, right? which he was proposing this kind of uh, very simple trip, five minutes, good. Um, so guys, okay, hope. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I think I'm doing okay. So the idea is that all the expensive devices, right? We want to outsource to the network, right? AKMT, Roger, Huawei, whatever, right? Google network. And we don't have a trusted network, but we don't trust the network, but we can run in very secure, okay? Uh, so the good news is, in principle, with QKG, this network could be untrusted. And even though it's expensive, it's okay, because all the resources will be shared by all the users, right? I mean, like, there will be one million people or one billion people using QKG, right? So they're using the same network. <laughs> so that's the hope. Um, well, it's got a dream, right? Um, so I hope MGA QKG will play one part in it, a small part in it, if, if you like. And in the long run, of course, to have internet, we have to talk about repeaters, right? And this morning's talk, we have had some discussion on quantum repeaters. Well, there's some sort of quantum calibration which could be useful uh, if you have to set that well. And maybe in the long run, people have also talked about quantum cloud computing or something like that. So, so that's a long term dream. Okay, so um, before I conclude, I should say a few words about uh, what I have been thinking about the problem. So I have done some work on this. Uh, device uh, stuff. Um, I think there would be another talk on silicon photonics uh, tomorrow, uh, but I should uh, just advertise um, one work that I have done with my collaborator, Professor Charles Spoon's group, uh, using this uh, preprint. So what we get is, I think it's like a first uh, demonstration of using silicon photonics for QKG transmission. So this is a QKG transmitter we made. Um, and then we cast individual components. In the actual demonstration, we only do the, I should say, in the actual demonstration, we only use a polarization encoding, okay? So we cannot, in the actual demonstration, QG demonstration, we don't use the R components for the chi and all that. But still, we manage to have a proof of principle QKG, okay? To prove that it works. 
Okay, so uh, you can read more about it in this uh, paper. I have no time to go into details. Um, last year, my collaborator, um, Koji, talked about this awful quantum quantum repeaters idea. The main idea is to remove mega quantum memories. And we want everything to be based on photons. Okay. Well, of course, I mean, I cannot go all the work myself, and then I don't want to get all the practice myself, so let me just thank my uh, collaborators. And so first of all, I want to thank people in my group, some students and collaborators, um, Lee Chen, um, Joyce. Um, OK, I'll go for some of them. Fei Hu is here. Uh, I think uh, it's a big gap. Bing is here. Um, Sun Feng is here, and Fei Hu is there. And, um, so I thank all these uh, collaborations and also thank some of people like Bang, Feihu, and Marcos for preparing all the slides because I, I don't prepare all good slides, right? So I modify them. Uh, I should thank you. This is a list of reference. And before I end, I should also maybe put a, some of the focus here. So this is um, me, uh, Joyce, and they are in U of e and in IQC. I mean, some of the work is done with Markov's group and Lakim's group and then Norbert's group. And there's some collaboration with Koji um, and Kiyoshi and some collaboration with Marcos. So um, maybe with that in mind. Oh, by the way, I'm not just a theorist. I actually have a lab, so I should uh, show a lab photo. Okay. So this is, uh, these are some photos in my lab. OK, maybe I should stop here. OK, thank you. <laughs> so these are the references. Yeah. Thanks, Hoi Kwong, for a very nice talk. So we have time for a few questions. Can you, you come up to the here? microphone? That'd be F. Uh, when you put this uh, plot of the fundamental limit versus uh, MDI performance yes. of key rates, um, was that Assumption for MDI was that with a single photon source or with a coherent source? Oh, okay, the MDI for the okay. Let me just show the graph first. Okay, uh, let me see. I'm trying to remember. Do you remember the slide number? Uh, okay. It was fairly early on. It was the the one where you're saying it's two orders of magnitude. Uh, okay, uh, let below. me see if I got the slide. Uh, this yeah, one. Yes. Okay, so the question is, uh, in this comparison of MKQQQ with the um, fundamental limit, uh, what assumptions do I make for the MKQQ? Do I consider single photon source On the or source. weak coherent pulse? Right? Is that the question? Yeah. Uh, I consider weak coherent pulse with key coherent So key coherent key coherent scale BBA4. Yeah. So is it, is it really the same? Like, is it very comparable to uh, just a regular decoy state without MDI, or is, or is there a gap there? Oh, um, well, because you, I think it's uh, very comparable because we are concerned with high efficiency here. Right? With high efficiency, it has the performance is very comparable. Okay. Okay. One of your slides, I think, said that there is a solution to uh, side channel attacks, as if you can verify that they are really are just single qubits coming out. How is that possible? Okay. <laughs> Maybe I haven't spoken. So let me just go back to the slide first, okay? Okay, um, well, I think the idea is that they think they, they think there's a fiber connected to the system, right? And physical fibers cannot survive if you put in too much power, right? So there's some limit on how much power you can do in, go in the fiber, right? And based on that, you can put some bound on the input in cancer game. And then after that, you can put in some alternator. So you can, I mean, basically, you have some idea, right, how much intensity is going into the ISM BOP system. And based on that, right, um, if you know the intensity, and then there's, of course, there are some assumptions, right? So based on that, you have to think about what kind of space Alice is representing there, and then I think cons they consider, um, I'm trying to make sense of it, I think they consider some sort of um, pulses, optical pulses from Eve to ISM BOP, and then try to, for a specific intensity, 
you can work out how much loss in the key rate you get. But of course, you are right. If you can imagine if you send in something else, right, which is totally outside this, this spectrum, right? So X-ray or something, right? Then well, that well, could be a problem. What we're thinking of, for instance, e even if it's sent through a fiber, uh, Alice, not meaning to, might, as, as in one of, of Vadim's slides, might, might send uh, the four different polaroids in, in different colors. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, there are some, okay, what they are doing is that they assume you, so of course in this whole game, we assume we have to ask, have to characterize the source, right? So I already characterized the source. She knows it's a very good source, so there's no side channel already. But the problem is, even then, if they send in an additional side channel, so get worry about the additional, you feel like additional side channel. In some All right, thanks. <laughs> but you're right, it's a big challenge, right? Side channels, how are we going to be put back out? <laughs> okay, so I guess we better move on. But before we do that, let's thank Hoi Kwang again. Thank you.